I'm delighted to be here again this evening. Thank you for coming. I hope your week of experimentation with the 23rd Psalm has been something that has been refreshing and vital for you. Um, sometimes we can fall into a little routine and kind of lose the point. Uh, so you have to experiment with the, the psalm meditatively, thoughtfully. You have to not just say the words, but let the words sink in. And uh, I hope that it has given you a, a sense of, of how change works. You see, when we try to change ourselves, like the song says, normally we fail. And that's because we focus on we, what we want to change, instead of changing what causes what we want to change. And uh, the uh, series that we're bringing here now is on healing the heart, uh, taking the center of the personality, bringing it to God, and out from the heart, let healing come to all parts of the person. Because in order to enable the heart to function differently, we have to change the other aspects. And tonight we're focusing on thought. And next week we'll be talking about feeling. Now, that's difficult because really you can't treat them separately. They interact. But for purposes of uh, teaching, uh, we're going to separate them out a bit. And uh, tonight we'll talk about thoughts mainly and then next week about feelings. And feelings are one of the hardest things to deal with. The ordinary person, whether they're Christians or not, are normally trapped by their feelings. And uh, that's one reason why we in this country are such an addictive society, is because we have essentially conceded to feelings the right to rule our lives. So we have to learn how to handle that. But actually, we can only handle that if we have dealt with thoughts. So now just a little bit of summary. Um, this is our theme that we started with, that uh, human life is increasingly made whole by living in interactive relationship with Jesus. And that is how we are healed, uh, is by this interactive relationship. And so the theme for the whole series has to do with that, the healing of the heart by walking daily with Jesus Christ. And uh, we are faced with the fact that, to begin with, we are broken. And uh, the character that we have uh, as human beings lies fundamentally in self-will. That is essentially destructive, and it turns inward on the self as well as outward and leaves us uh, where we don't work. Broken just means we don't work. And, uh, of course, that's the common human condition. And uh, we want to take just a little time here to look at this passage, Galatians 5, because this is a picture of the brokenness. And we have to have that fixed before us before we can really deal with uh, the remedy that comes to us in Christ. Now, this is a kind of a tough passage uh, because, I mean, it really, Paul really does lay stuff out uh, on the line. And you have to read Paul as if he were a social scientist, a psychologist, a uh, historian, uh, someone. You know, we have this problem in reading the Bible that we think somehow it's in a different category. And it, we have to get over that. It's, it, this, is, this is basic instruction about the realities of human life. And uh, in this passage, Paul is talking about the works of the flesh. Um, and the conflict between the flesh and the spirit. And this is basic brokenness. This is brokenness 101. Uh, verse 17. The flesh sets its desire against the spirit. And the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another. So that you may not do the things that you want to do. You may not do the things that you want to do. The three main dimensions of brokenness are moral failure, unhappiness, and incapacity to accomplish the good 
that you set before you. There's three things. Inability to do what you know to be right. I mean, of course, sometimes you can, but then many times you can't. You're overwhelmed by the things around you and the things within you. And so just doing the thing that is right. For example, just telling the truth. Just being sensitive and loving to other people. Uh, number one thing that gets in the way there is fear. I mean, that's, that's why people don't tell the truth. Uh, is fear they won't get what they want if they do. See, um, I may have told you about the little girl in Sunday school who's asked what a lie is, and she said it's an abomination to God and a very present help in time of trouble. <laughs> yeah. She kind of got her scriptures mixed up there. But see, she's right on. She understood that, see. And fear comes into the life. That's why it's so important to know the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not lack. So I can tell the truth. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not lack. So I can actually pay attention to other people. Be aware of them and not just be thinking about how they affect me. See. And uh, so I don't I want to go into this at length. I hope you see how that works. And then just happiness. People are so unhappy. Uh, and they can't find rest and peace. See, they're broken. And then uh, one of the things that is so important is how can I accomplish the good which I find before myself in this world? I'm not talking about anything especially religious here. I'm just talking about creating good things and being a blessing to others and achieving the aspirations of my heart to count for something good in this world. See, everyone has that. There, there really isn't any exception to it. Everyone wants to leave the world a better place than they found it. And that's built into us. That's a part of our nature in the image of God is having a desire to create what is good. But we can't do that on our own. And self-will, as it comes in, breaks us up. Now, here's the outcome. Um, the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, so so sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissension, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like that. See? Now, when, when, we are, when we live from self-will, we have resort to these kinds of things in order to succeed with our project of getting what we want. And if, you, if we had time to just look at all of these, you'd see that that's, that's what's involved here. This is the natural outcome of a life that is devoted to getting what I want, see. And so, uh, now, in contrast to that, um, you see the fruit of the Spirit is law, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and so on. Well, why does it call it fruit? It calls it fruit because these only come from the deep character of the person. Love, joy, peace, alongside. Just think about joy. What is joy? Well, joy is a pervasive sense of well-being. It just and it, it goes with peace, you know. Uh, it, peace is real peace when it hits your body. See, there's so little peace. I mean, we have an epidemic of sleeplessness in this country. And it's really tied to the lack of peace. And sometimes it's tied to garbage trucks backing up at 2 o'clock in the morning saying, beep, beep, beep. But you know, some people can even sleep through that. And peace, love, joy, peace, all those things come from the transformation that changed me on the inside, you see. 
that goes beyond trying to modify behavior and touches the springs of behavior in the cell. We have one fellow here is sitting here reading Aristotle's ethics. Would you believe that? Aristotle had the problem that every human being has, which is how to, how to have people who are able to just do the right thing and be happy. That's the universal problem. And Jesus responds to that and the Old Testament teaching about the law and about the nature of God and the wonderful expression of the spirituality of the Psalms. See, that's a life that can actually produce people that can do the things that are right, can be happy, can devote themselves to what is good and know the power of God in realizing it. So, um, now, until we change this setup here, th these are the dimensions of the human self. Every one of you got one of those. Right? And uh, these are parts of the human self that work together, and sometimes we're dominated by one or another, but the basic problem here is that that's permeated with me, 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 me. Not with God, 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 God. Right? So that's why both in the Old Testament and the New, the, the law of God is summed up in the simple teaching, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. See, that's, all, that's where that comes from. Now, some of you may get worried, your theological types, about uh, trichotomy and dichotomy. Uh, I just want to say to you that when Paul says in the last chapter of 1 Thessalonians that he prays that you would be sanctified in your whole soul, body, and spirit, body, soul, and spirit, he's not trying to give you uh, a, a, an anatomy of the human self. I mean, that's not his purpose there. So don't worry about that. Uh, some people worry about it because they think this is uh, cutting into Paul's teaching. But Paul's teaching there is not intended to be an analysis of the human self. And if you, if you take it, you're going to wind up with questions like, okay, where's the mind? In the soul or the spirit or the body? And so on. So try to just not worry about that. Um, there's a huge theological discussion about whether or not uh, we should be trichotomist or dichotomist. Well, you can go to heaven either way. Um, all right. But I actually think it's very helpful if you will think about these. All three, all, all five or six of these. What do we got? Five. And the, the, the spirit is the inner part. It's like the executive center of the self. It's the will. And there's a basic problem with the will, and we've talked about that. Namely, it is directed to getting my own way. Now then, uh, the word and spirit of Christ come in to my mind, and through my mind, my spirit can receive it, and change can begin. Now I have new life. I have resources that I didn't have before. But that's not the end of the story. See, having that, I am able to relate back to God. And my faith in God, the primary function really of the will is to trust God. That's the bedrock layer of the will is to trust God. And to turn away from God and to trust oneself is the root of all corruption. Right? I am my shepherd. I'm in real trouble. Right? Right? That's the way that one goes. I'm in my show. Well, I, you know. Now, when I have turned back to the Lord, and now his power is working in me, my heart is directed rightly, then I have to deal with the rest of the story. Now, God constantly reaches out to everyone. And the ways I've listed here, we talked a little bit about. We don't have time to be thorough on them. But God is looking for people who will worship him in spirit and in truth. 
And you know, many of the people who have been most holy and powerful in the life of Christ have been people who didn't find God in church. Like C.S. Lewis, for example, he tells a story how when he got into the sidecar of his brother's motorcycle to ride to another place, he was an unbeliever. And when he, when he got out, he was. Now, you might take that as a comment on his brother's driving. But actually, that's the way the Lord is. You may know that in many countries, in, uh, especially East Africa and the Middle East, uh, many Muslims are finding Christ because Christ is appearing to them. See, he, Christ is able to reach out. God is looking for people to worship him in spirit and in truth. And in all ways, he's always reaching out. And uh, the constant general goodness of God that Jesus spoke so much about, for example, in Matthew 6, when he says, don't be anxious, because God cares for you. God loves you. And that is the avenue towards healing uh, as we find our way out of the brokenness of human life, is to trust God. Now, let me just say, it isn't a big theological deal. Uh, let me tell you that you can be wrong about a lot of things about God and still trust him. You don't have to have all your doctrines straight. Really, the only thing that's required is you have to have in your thought the idea, Jesus is really it. Jesus is the greatest. And if you have that confidence in him, and you call out to him, and you begin to act in that confidence, no matter how wrong you may be, or uninformed you may be about doctrines, he will pull you straight. You know, I often say to people, you're not saved because you're right in your doctrine. If anything, you're right in your doctrine because you're saved. It's only the living relationship to Jesus that can actually pull us straight and begin to help us find our way uh, in him uh, towards the fullness that is in Christ. So really, whosoever shall call on the Lord shall be saved. That's what it takes. You see, that's the turn away from oneself. And it's very practical. It's not mainly theological. It is something where you can begin where you are, no matter where you are, who you are, no matter who you are, and begin to say, I will trust Jesus Christ at this point with what is now, what I'm now dealing with. And when one does that, then God finds you. Christ finds you. And there begins the interactive relationship, which is eternal life. See, eternal life is now in session. It isn't future, it's now. It's like the kingdom of God. It isn't coming into existence. There will be some changes and some advances, but basically it's here now, and that's what Jesus preached. And when we put our confidence in him, then he brings us into the kingdom of God through the new birth. And then from that point of view, all of the wonderful promises that... Uh, God gives and that we see in Jesus Christ become real. We find we are able to do what is right. We find that we are happy. We find that we can even be content no matter what our circumstances are. And of course, that's the secret of the 23rd Psalm. But the 23rd Psalm is simply placing the saving faith that puts God back on the throne. And then through Jesus, we are believers in God. He's the one who helps us really understand what God is like. And we see that God raised him from the dead. And we realize that he's now present in our life. And if we're working in a school or a business or whatever it may be, in the army or the police or whatever our place in life might be, then we began to understand that Jesus is right there with us and he's in action. 
Now, as long as we're on the throne, he'll let us run it. But when we abandon the throne and we say, I'm going to turn my life loose and see how you run it, then things begin to change. So our efforts now meet with his spirit. We don't become passive. I said that last time, and it's so important to say it again and again, uh, because uh, even our, our songs often, open the, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. We need the Lord to help us. But how about us opening the eyes of our heart, too? Right? Can we do that? Not by ourselves, but with God. It's something also for us to do. We pray for this to happen, but yet we devote ourselves to it. So when we pray, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, the question comes back, what are you looking at now? See? And so... Our efforts meet with his spirit and grace progressively redeems every dimension of the self so that, what, that we increasingly love God in the way that Jesus said. See how that works? Now, uh, this is what is called working out our salvation. See, salvation is your relationship to God. Okay? That's your relationship. Salvation is not something that's going to happen to you later. Basic idea of salvation is deliverance. Deliverance. And you study that scripturally, you'll see uh, how, that, how that is used. But deliverance is now. Deliverance is now. And whatever circumstance we are in, and we're primarily talking about the broken condition of human life. By the way, I'm up here tonight instead of down there like I was last time because some folks said we couldn't see you. So I'm going to try to stay up here. <laughs> but it's, see, deliverance is from the broken condition of human life. And then heaven when you die is a natural consequence of that. But your salvation is that relationship out of which healing comes. And when that relation is established because the Spirit and the Word have now come into your heart and it has brought the news of the availability of Jesus and that he will really be my shepherd and I don't have to take on that job myself. When that comes and I say, yes, I want it to be that way. I want it to be that way. Well, then that relationship, which is our salvation, is established. And I want to say it again because there's a lot of confusion about this. And many people think their salvation is having heaven nailed down. Well, heaven will be nailed down if you have a relationship of trust to Jesus Christ and his Father. But it will be nailed down not because there was a transfer of credit. That happens too. It'll be nailed down because you are in a vital relationship to Jesus now. So Paul speaks that way. You know, Colossians 3, if you then be risen with Christ, that's the assumption. Risen with Christ means that now there is a life in us which is not of us. That we are sharing the life of Jesus. Jesus is alive and he is acting in this universe with the Holy Spirit and with his Father and that wonderful community, that divine community is actually conducting the universe. And we are permitted to come into union with that and begin to move with it. See, eternal life is when, my eternal life is when I immerse what I'm doing in what God is doing. My life becomes a part of God's life. And that's what makes it eternal. Right? Now when that happens, then there's still work to do. And Paul talks about it in terms of working out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Because, why? Because of the one that's working with you. Uh, God is working with you. 
And because he's working with you, you need to be conscious of that. And not arrogant and not presumptuous, but rather uh, saying, well, I must be attentive to what God is doing today with me. Now, the fear and trembling there is not fear and trembling in the sense of something dreadful that's about to happen to you. It isn't like you take a wrong step and you're dead. That's not what the fear and trembling is about. The fear and trembling there is uh, something is something that comes upon us because of the preciousness of what we're working with. See, so watch a father hold a newborn baby for the first time. See, or or any kind of dealing with something that is tremendously precious, you're 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 concerned to do the right thing with it. And because God is working in my life today, then I want to be sure and make a place for him. I want to be sure and follow his instructions as far as I know. I want to be sure to ask him to change me on the inside. But then I'm going to do the things that may change me on the inside also. Okay, so now that's where we come to the thought life and the feelings. The thought life and the feelings are absolutely essential for the changes that have to happen. And uh, let's uh, uh, consider now what the thought life consists in. The thought life consists primarily of the images and preoccupations, the ways of thinking that we're habitually involved in. Images. Images are tremendously important. They're very dangerous. They can also be a great blessing. Um, the image of the Lord as my shepherd. You see, that's an image. And we can keep that present in our minds. And it can make a tremendous difference to us as we go through the day and as we go through our life. Uh, all the whole thing that's described there in that psalm, you see, that covers everything from the Lord is my shepherd now, he takes care of my physical needs, uh, he leads me in paths of righteousness, he restores my soul uh, to the conflicts of life, the dangers of life, through death and forever. You see, that, that image is extremely powerful. And that's why it shows up in so much of art and uh, in uh, Christian bookstores and uh, churches, church buildings and things of that sort because it's such a powerful image. Now the question is, is that the image that occupies my mind? Is that how I see myself in the world when I'm dealing with my desires and my frustrations and my efforts to get things done is that image the one that is constantly present in my mind or is it an image of being forsaken in the world of being at the mercy of everything and having really no hope as the scripture says without God and without hope in the world so these images are patterns of interpretation of events uh, the meaning of a smile or a frown or a handshake or something that someone said. See, the patterns of interpret that's a part of our thinking. And we have to be very careful of them. We know how harmful it can be to misinterpret people's uh, gestures and uh, their f facial appearance and the words that they, they might speak. And uh, so the world is full of animosity and distancing and attack and anger because of the way we interpret um, things that happen to us. So now, um, Ephesians 5.26 uses this image of the washing of the water of the word. And it applies there to the church. 
but you know, it's good for us sometimes to think of ourselves as um, needing a washing. And uh, when things get dirty, there's all sorts of stuff in them. A shirt, for example, if you have a dirty shirt. Uh, there's all sorts of stuff that's in that shirt that shouldn't be there. And the word, when uh, the water and the soap and whatever else you use, when you put that in there, that removes the dirt. That removes what should not be there. The washing of the water of the word does the same thing. It takes all of the images, the harmful ways of interpreting and thinking that make up the ordinary person's mind and in place of that puts other things. And what a tremendous need there is for that. Uh, look just a moment at uh, 1 Corinthians 10, uh, 2 Corinthians 10. You know this passage possibly. Paul is talking about here, though we walk in the flesh, that is in the natural abilities, we do not war in terms of the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. That's 2 Corinthians 10, 4. The destruction of fortresses. Another word is stronghold. The destruction of strongholds. See, our minds have strongholds in them. If you go back to the people that were described there in Galatians 5 as manifesting the works of the flesh. One of the things that's most interesting is when you begin to talk to them, they have mental strongholds for what they're doing. And that is a very sobering and difficult thing to think about. Uh, nearly all of those strongholds are devoted to the kinds of ideas that would prove to, that would serve to justify uh, what they're doing. And our world is full of that. I have a, uh, I was reading a review today of a book on a woman named Iris Murdoch. And uh, the, uh, the writer used this language. He said, according to Wilson, the writer, um, perhaps the most important element of her personal life was her lesbianism. Now you think about that. Actually, that's the way many people would think today. And I'm not, I'm not just talking about lesbianism. I mean, I'm talking about any kind of sexuality. I mean, it, I hope you, if I come to your place, you won't introduce me as one of the world's leading heterosexuals. <laughs> mm -hmm. But you see, in our culture, because it is a sensualist culture that is devoted to feelings, people's feelings are elevated to the point to where something like this can actually be the most important element of her personal life. Now think of that. And you say, well, what about her family? What about the work she was trying to do? Actually, she was uh, a writer and had considerable success with it uh, and professed to be trying to do things that would help the world, as I say, be a better place. Isn't that more important than your sexuality? Now, you see, I raise that to illustrate the strongholds. See, we live today with a massive stronghold on this point that leads people to say things like this. It's a reflection of the sensual nature of our culture. And if you want to see the sensual nature of our culture, just watch the advertisements on television. I mean, one of the things that most amazes me is the way cars are advertised on television. You know, they actually sing love songs to them now. You know? Someday my love will come along. I think that was a Cadillac or a Mercedes or something like that. Now, see, that's stronghold stuff. And as long as a person's mind is tied in knots with these things, they cannot think straight about their life. I mean, what, what does it matter what kind of a car you drive? Well, I mean, it matters if you won't run. Uh, but beyond that... Uh, Beyond that, it doesn't matter an awful lot. And uh, 
So we have this problem now with these strongholds, and Paul is addressing that. And uh, he is, look at what he says in verse 5 there. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. See, the rationalizations of the world have to be overcome. Because the world will come and say, no, nah, the Lord isn't your shepherd. What kind of a world do you think this is? Right? You must be a fool. And then the worldly wisdom will begin to roll about what you might do to prove that you actually are really very smart. Well, then you have to say, my being smart isn't exactly the issue here. Right? But for many people it is. It's an ego thing. People get into this with reference to things like God speaking to you, or God leading you, or answers to prayer. Many people are permanently stopped in their prayer life because they pray, God answers, and they say, eh, maybe that's a coincidence. Or God speaks to them, and God doesn't normally speak in a loud voice. You know, like the voice from the Mormon tabernacle or something. It is. You, you don't know God's voice because it has that overwhelming quality. You have to learn it. And when God speaks to you, you can well say, yeah, no, maybe, that, maybe that's just my thought. And then you won't obey. Right? And now there, there are things you have to learn how to hear that. But see, the important thing is that we don't exalt our own thinking and our own smartness uh, as a way of trying to run our lives. 